Hello and welcome to lecture number 11 in our series on drugs and human behavior. Today we are going to be talking about antipsychotic medications. This is obviously a class of drugs that are used entirely for the treatment of mental disorders, in particular schizophrenia. So today we're going to talk about uh, schizophrenia and do a brief introduction to uh, what we think might cause schizophrenia, some of the as symptoms associated with schizophrenia talk about neurotransmitters that might be implicated in sch schizophrenia, do a historical background, uh, and talk about the way we classify antipsychotics, so it's a little strange, truth be told, uh, talk about the first generation antipsychotics, the second generation antipsychotics, talk about the side effects of those second generation antipsychotics, and then finally finish up with new developments in this area and uh, some other uses for this class of drugs. So schizophrenia is a particularly uh, debilitating uh, mental disorder. The core features of this particular uh, disease are that for at least six months, the presence of prominent psychotic symptoms, which are present for at least one week, their psychosocial functioning is poor, and if they have any present, their mood disturbance is brief versus their psychotic symptoms. So little mood disturbance, but lots of psychotic symptoms. There are three phases associated with schizophrenia, what we call the pre-morbid phase, where they have subtle motor, cognitive, and social impairments. The prodromal phase is where mood symptoms start to appear. They start to get some cognitive symptoms. Schizophrenia is associated with a variety of difficulties in frontal lobe functioning. They may also experience social withdrawal or obsessive behaviors. The full syndrome then is substantial functional deterioration in self-care, work, and interpersonal relationships. Schizophrenia is considered to be a neurodevelopmental disease. There are significant abnormalities present in both brain structure and function in patients with schizophrenia. It has a high heritability component. There is some current belief that this is an epigenetic disease, that is, you have to be born with the propensity for schizophrenia, and then some event triggers the activation of genes for this particular disease. Uh, this is a misconnection syndrome, that is, there is a reduction in connections across parts of the brain that result in a variety of symptoms. And finally, quite recently, this has been linked to prenatal nicotine exposure. So there is some evidence that smoking during pregnancy might be that environmental trigger that results in the development of schizophrenia. Again, early to tell, but there is early evidence for that. The symptoms of schizophrenia are classically divided into both posi positive and negative clusters. Positive symptoms are not good things, but they are the addition of things, whereas the negative things are things that are essentially missing. So the positive symptoms include delusions, hallucinations, thought disorders, loosening of associations. Uh, the hallucinations in this disorder are typically uh, auditory in nature. The hearing voices is sort of the prototypical schizophrenia symptom. Negative symptoms include anhedonia, so an inability to um, experience joy or pleasure or emotion at all. They're often withdrawn. They often have limited affect uh, or emotional expression. The treatment focus is primarily in improvement of cognitive functioning and quality of life, so oftentimes limiting hallucinations and trying to improve uh, overall quality of life and cognitive functioning. The classic theory of schizophrenia is primarily one involving dopamine. So the disorder seems to have developed from dysregulation of dopaminergic brain pathways, resulting in overactivity of dopaminergic function. A uh, couple of lines of evidence in this area, the abuse of stimulant drugs increases synaptic dopamine concentrations, such as amphetamine, and can produce a syndrome that's indistinguishable from the paranoid type of schizophrenia. People hear things, uh, quite paranoid, uh, delusions of persecution, etc. Uh, the antipsychotic drugs we're going to talk about are primarily dopamine receptor antagonists that block dopamine receptors in the brain. And so we know if we reduce dopamine functioning, we treat schizophrenia. If we increase dopamine, we can end up with uh, symptoms similar to schizophrenia. If you look at the uh, treatments used for uh, schizophrenia, you can see that if you look at the, so haloperidol is the uh, drug that is sort of the reference point in this particular graph. And what this is showing you is comparing the percentage or the concentration of the drug uh, 
that inhibits uh, haloperidol binding by 50%. So you get the same sort of inhibited haloperidol binding. So it's basically showing you that it's taking up the same receptors as haloperidol and what the average clinical dose is. And so you can see that the um, more um, receptor sites that the drug is taking up, the lower the dose has to be. So this is a direct relationship between dopamine receptor response and the dose of these particular drugs. Pretty remarkable. Dopamine, of course, is released by neurons in the basal ganglia of the brain and is crucial for maintaining normal coordination of movement. Oftentimes, long-term chronic antipsychotic administration may elicit symptoms of abnormal motor functioning, such as what we call extrapyramidal symptoms, or tardive dyskinesia, which is a um, almost freezing of, of muscles in sort of grotesque ways. Uh, extrapyramidal symptoms are essentially just like, uh, are very similar to pseudo what we call pseudoparkinson's. Second generation antipsychotic efficacy can be attained with little or no extrapyramidal symptoms or tardive dyskinesia. So good news, newer antipsychotics uh, can get effective treatment without the uh, side effects of the older generation of drugs. So the clinical evidence for dopamine involvement in schizophrenia, the antipsychotics uh, obviously block dopamine's effect, presumably at the receptor, but is that required for the therapeutic benefit or is that related to the side effects? So some open questions there. So the prediction here is if the blockade is required for the therapeutic effect, then drugs that are more potent clinically should also be more potent at blocking dopamine receptors and we saw that in that graph a minute ago. Serotonin involvement in this drug, or in this um, disorder, the 5-HT2 receptor, in, uh, if it's antagonized, might be responsible for some of the beneficial actions of antipsychotics, so antagonism of the 5-HT2 receptor. Um, although it has been concluded that serotonin does not play an important role in the cause of schizophrenia, antagonism of 5-HT receptors may be involved in improved neurological side effects profiles of the newer antipsychotic medications. So antagonism of the 5-HT2 receptor may be the important component of this uh, very complicated puzzle. There may be some glutamate involvement in this disorder as well. Amphetamine, LSD, uh, PCP, and ketamine have provided insight into the neurochemistry of schizophrenia or at least certainly some of the symptoms associated with schizophrenia because they can produce schizophrenia-like symptoms. They block the NMDA type glutamate receptors. Uh, NMDA hypofunction results in excessive release of ex excitatory neurotransmitters glutamate and acetylcholine in the frontal cortex. Cortical neurons can then be damaged and deterioration triggered. And so we see that in schizophrenia. So this overactivation uh, from release of these excitatory neurotransmitters may be involved in this process. So to provide a little bit of background, um, the first category of antipsychotic agents were the phenothiazines. They were initially developed as antihistamines. In fact, the massive sedating uh, effects of these drugs are because of their antihistamine properties. So they have a mildly sedating action or massively sedating action, depending on your, um, your response. So promethazine uh, was the first uh, phenothiazine. Uh, chlorpromazine, which is Thorazine, was really the big first massively used antipsychotic um, and really revolutionized the treatment of this particular disorder. And the second generation antipsychotics are the butyrophenones, which came out in the 1960s by caloperidol, um, droperidol. In the 1980s, clozapine was, or clozaril was used for quite a while. It has some serious side effects and led to the development of other atypical antipsychotics uh, like risperidone, olanzapine, quetiapine, uh, zepressidone, aripirazole, and etc. So there's a pretty significant um, number of drugs in the arsenal for this. Uh, clozapine is not used anymore uh, because of its huge side, or it shouldn't be used anymore because of its massive side effect profile. All these second generation antipsychotics differ pharmacologically from the first generation antipsychotics. They have relatively less affinity for the D2 receptors and greater affinity for those 5-HT receptors we talked about. 
This allows the separation between the antipsychotic efficacy and induction of extrapyramidal symptoms for other movement disorders. So if we look at the comparative efficacy, safety, and cost-benefit ratio of second-generation antipsychotics, while clozapine was superior to first-generation antipsychotics, only olanzapine and risperidone appear to be better than those first-generation antipsychotics. Um, there are some criticisms of those conclusions because of differences in dosage and difficulty in patient recruitment. Doing this kind of research is obviously very difficult. This is a relatively rare disorder. Getting access to a population, getting uh, ethically uh, valid um, studies designed and put together can be very difficult. So I want to take a, a quick look at a couple of studies to preview some of the issues we're going to be talking about. The KD study, which is the Clinical Antipsychotic Trials of Intervention and Effectiveness, was an 18-month study of almost 1,500 uh, patients suffering from schizophrenia at 57 clinical sites comparing uh, perfenazine with alonzapine, quidipine, zepresidone, and risperidone. Uh, one of the biggest problems is patients often stop these medications before the end of the study because of side effect profiles. Uh, the findings from this study, olanzapine associated with more weight gain or metabolic effects. Uh, it was slightly more effective. Uh, perfenazine was equally effective to all the atypical agents. Uh, risperidone and olanzapine were more effective than the others. Clozapine was more, than more effective than other atypical agents in the treatment of, treatment of schizophrenia. Unfortunately, its side effect profile makes it almost impossible for so many people to take. Uh, the cost utility of the latest an antipsychotic drugs in schizophrenia studies are the Cutlass study. Um, much smaller study. Um, primary outcomes were measures of quality of life, symptoms, adverse effects, etc. Um, patients with schizophrenia did just as well on antipsychotic drugs from either category. Patients taking first generation antipsychotics showed a trend toward greater improvement on the quality of life scale and symptom scores, uh, and participants expressed no clear preference and the costs were similar. So we're really at a loss as to what to recommend. It really is a trial and error. Uh, oftentimes. And so while a drug like Clozarel might not be the best choice because of its side effect profile, it might be something that's worth considering. So there's no clear clinical advantages of, of the second generation antipsychotics over first generations in the treatment of schizophrenia. There may be advantages in improved relapse prevention, reduced extrapyramidal symptoms, and tardive di dyskinesia, and they are possibly useful for treatment of bipolar depression. The problem with these second generations is they tend to be more expensive. They can be associated with weight gain and other metabolic problems. And we're going to take a look at some of those um, side effect issues um, later on in this discussion. So these are issues to keep in mind as we start looking at uh, these different classes of drugs. So the first generation antipsychotics are the phenothiazines and the butyrophenones. Uh, oftentimes these are called major tranquilizers or neuroleptics. Uh, they're pretty good at alleviating positive symptomology. They, however, have no effect on negative symptomology, so they don't improve that flat affect uh, and apathy. Uh, they cause Parkinsonian type side effects because of their um, fairly significant dopamine profile, and there are uh, very few non-psychiatric uses for these drugs. So control of, uh, the, but there are a few. So control of nausea and vomiting, for example, uh, is one of those. So one of the drugs we'll talk about here in a moment uh, is used almost entirely for that purpose. These are the drugs of choice up until the sort of mid to late 1990s. Uh, in terms of the pharmacokinetics of these drugs, they tend to be lipid soluble and highly bound to protein and tissues with large distribution volumes. They have a 20 to 40 hour half-life. Uh, they're extensively metabolized, and in fact, some of those metabolites can be detected for months after they're discontinued. So pretty long uh, profile of these drugs. Uh, to take a look at this in sort of entire list of these drugs, uh, the phenothiazines include thorazine compazine, which is almost entirely used for uh, treatment of nausea, uh, prolixin, stelazine, uh, trilophon, tindal, all of these are melaril, uh, are drugs that are in this early class of drugs. Um, Haldol is the butyrophenone that's uh, primarily prescribed. Uh, and then you get into the newer generations, including Clozarel, Risperdal, Zyprexa, Seroquel, Abilify, all of those. We'll talk a little bit about those. So you can take a look at the autonomic side effects, the involuntary movement side effects, and their levels of sedation. So uh, th uh, Thorazine has pretty high sedation level, so does Compazine. Um, 
the newer antipsychotics have low to moderate sedation effects, and the sedating effects uh, tend to have pretty high, uh, pretty low tolerance. That, that is, people tolerate them pretty well, so you don't develop tolerance to them pretty quickly. Um, so these first-generation antipsychotic drugs um, block the dopamine 2 receptor, acetylcholine, histamine, and norepinephrine receptors. So by blocking the dopamine receptors in the basal ganglia, this is where they produce two kinds of motor disturbances, which include these acute extrapyramidal reactions and tardive dyskinesia. Side effects include akathisia, which is a restlessness. Uh, this seems to be very distressing to most patients. They also can get some dystonia, which is involuntary muscle contractions and sustained abnormal bizarre postures of the limbs, trunk, head, and tongue. Uh, and again, this neuroleptic-induced Parkinsonism, they get sort of a tremor at rest, uh, what's called a cogwheel-type rigidity of the limbs and slowing of movement with a reduction in spontaneous activity. So pretty difficult to live with side effects. So tardive dyskinesia is uh, involuntary hyperkinetic movements, often of the face and tongue, but also the trunks and limbs, and can be quite disabling. There's no adequate treatment for tardive dyskinesia. Um, So it's something to keep in mind. Possibly clozapine or other second-generation antipsychotic can be used instead. Um, side effects and toxicity. Uh, sedation. Again, there's some tolerance to that. Uh, postural or orthostatic hypotension. Lower blood pressure. Again, some tolerance develops to that. Uh, lowered seizure threshold, which is obviously problematic. Photosensitivity is a massive side effect of um, Thorazine. And there are, of course, anticholinergic side effects for those that affect uh, the muscarnic system, constipation, dry mouth, blurry vision, and some significant memory problems. So the major adverse effects of the receptor blockade by the neuroleptics, again, D2 receptors, extrapyramidal symptoms, and prolactin release. The norepinephrine is responsible for the postural hypotension, histamine blockade, uh, sedation, drowsiness, and weight gain. And the acetylcholine is where we get the memory deficits, some other side effects. And then finally, the 5-HT, 1B, and 2C uh, are, uh, seem to be associated with the weight gain effects for these drugs. So haloperidol, um, when I worked in mental health long, long ago, this was the drug that most was most often given. It was introduced in 1967 as the first alternative to phenothiazines. It blocks the D2 receptors. Again, this also causes Parkinsonism and other motor disorders comparable to those induced by high-potency phenothiazines. Moban and Loxetane um, were introduced in the 70s. Loxapine binds strongly to both dopaminergic and serotonergic receptors. Uh, ORAP is used for treatment of motor and phonic tics in patients with Tourette's disorder. Um, but really, the, um, Thorazine, thyrodazine, and haloperidol are the primary drugs used for treating schizophrenia from this class. In the second generation antipsychotics, we start with uh, clozapines. We're used to symptoms in about 30% of those who do not improve with standard drugs, so it's a good drug of uh, sort of last resort. It practically produces no Parkinsonian side effects or tardive dyskinesia, meaning patients who also could not tolerate other drugs because of these side effects can be helped by clozapine, also may reduce negative symptoms. Its action is that non-dopamine receptors produces non-therapeutic effects, so the histamine antagonism produces drowsiness and weight gain. The alpha adrenergic 1 antagonism causes dizziness and decreased blood pressure. Its anticholinergic blockade causes drowsiness, hypersalivation, blurred vision, constipation, and significant cognitive impairment. Greatest concern with clozapine is the risk of, resists, uh, the risk of developing severe life-threatening agranulocytosis, which is a loss of white blood cells, which can be obviously very uh, problematic. About 40% of patients report significant sedation, which results in um, very little compliance uh, for this drug. The other major problem is 80% of, of patients gain 20 pounds or more uh, is not unusual for drugs uh, for this particular drug. It's the least prescribed and really has some of the worst side effects of the antipsychotics. Risperidone or Risperdal is a 5-HT2 and D2 blocker. And the latter D2 blocker improves antipsychotic and reduces extrapyramidal effects. It uh, has an active intermediate, which is 9-hydroxyrisperidone, which has a half-life of 23 hours. Side effects of this drug include agitation, anxiety, insomnia, headache, nausea, extrapyramidal symptoms at higher doses. Its uses include uh, as a first-line drug, especially when negative symptoms predominate in the first episode. 
It's indicated for the treatment of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and irritability in individuals with autism. It's pharmacokinetic, or it's pharmacodynamic, sorry. It results in reduced aggression, uh, depreptive symptomology, and increased energy, and global functioning in patients with borderline personality disorder. Uh, it has a long-acting injectable form, which is now available. Uh, it's encapsulated in biodegradable polymer microspheres and a water-based solution, so when you inject it, it's, uh, these dissolve over time. And so a single ultra intramuscular dose can last uh, for up to two weeks. Zyprexa is like clozapine, but devoid of the white blood cell metabolism uh, from a toxic intermediate. It has a D2 and 5-HT2 blockade. The latter is much greater. Improves both positive and negative symptomology. Side effects include weight gain, almost as much with clozapine, sedation, dizziness, orthostatic hypotension. The intramuscular version is so shown to be superior for severe agitation in bipolar mania and schizophrenia. Seroquel uh, is the fifth atypical 5-HT2-D2 antipsychotic that became available. It's comparable to haloperidol in reducing positive symptoms with few extrapyramidal symptoms. There are long-acting versions. It's approved for use in acute and maintenance treatment of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and as an adjunctive treatment for major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder maintenance and adolescent mania. Shown to be superior to valproate in treating mania. So we'll talk about valproate and when we get to we're talking about bipolar disorder. The second generation antipsychotics have pretty uh, terrible side effects or potential. One of the most significant of those is weight gain. Animal studies examining drug actions on the lateral hypothalamic neurons that express orexins, which are proteins involved in feeding stimulation and weight regulation. Clozapine, risperidone, and olanzapine increase orexin activity, whereas haldol, zoprazidone, and amphetamine do not. This suggests increased orexin secretion may underlie weight and appetite gains of certain atypical psychotic drugs, antipsychotic drugs. Um, and so it's through this um, other protein that you get the side effects of weight gain. If you look at the amount, percentage of participants showing weight gain, uh, you can see uh, Aripirazole, which is Abilify, is at about 20% versus Clozapine, which is about 54%. Uh, in 2003, use of atypical antipsychotics was associated with the development of diabetes. At the time, it's not known if these drugs affect gluco meta glucose metabolism or increase risk factors. It's been shown that Zyprexa impacts glucose metabolism independent of weight gain. If there are increases in plasma glucose levels at fasting and after glucose, glucose challenge, even in non-obese patients. So it's very clear that this drug is causing some risk of diabetes. Uh, risperdone is much less riskier for this particular side effect than olanzapine. One of the biggest problems um, with the second generation drugs um, and even some first generation drugs are sudden cardiac death. This is caused by a drug-induced QT interval prolongation without getting too far down the rabbit hole on uh, reading the um, e uh, electrocardiograms of um, patients on antipsychotics. Uh, suffice to say that it is associated with um, the uh, beats of the heart. Uh, you get this what's called twisted points arrhythmias or trasadas de puentes. Uh, and the antipsychotic most associated with this thyroidazine, so it can be potentially dangerous. Some new developments um, in this area. Uh, there are two drugs here in clinical testing um, with the D3 and D2 partial agonists that show little weight gain or metabolic problems, and another with high D2 receptor occupancy and low 5-HT receptor blocking. Other potential uses for antipsychotic medications include bipolar disorder, unipolar depression, delusions and aggression and dementia, autism spectrum disorders, PTSD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar dis no sorry borderline personality disorder, and Parkinson's disease. Um, in terms of the applications that these are approved for, um, Abilify is approved for acute mania or mixed. Um, episodes of bipolar disorder, uh, good for maintenance th therapy, 
uh, and possibly resistant depression, irritability, and autism. Um, so you can see some of these drugs are associated with uh, treatment for bipolar and other uh, resistant depression. So sometimes uh, alonzapine can be combined with fluoxetine uh, as a way to treat resistant depression. Uh, so most, uh, most of these drugs are useful in treating bipolar disorder. Only a few of these drugs are, as additions to current treatment, are thought to be useful in unipolar depression. We'll talk about depression next. Uh, delusions and aggressions in dementia. Unfortunately, these drugs will worsen the cognitive symptoms associated with dementia. For uh, patients who are autism spectrum disorder patients, these are only useful in treating aggression and stereotypic behaviors. For PTSD, only treatment of psychotic symptoms. For obsessive compulsive disorder, the second generation uh, antipsychotics have been shown to be effective in treatment of OCD, generalized anxiety disorders, and panic disorders. Um, there seems to be no effect for most of these on borderline personality disorder. Mood stabilizers have been shown to have some benefit. And then finally, Parkinson's, uh, quetiapine is the preferred treatment uh, there. So uh, these drugs have a lot of other uses. Uh, some of them uh, are better than others, and so certainly uh, look into these if there are things you are interested in. Well, thank you. Um, that is our discussion of antipsychotics. We'll be talking about antidepressants next.